Welcome to Auto and Sons Nursery. Today we're going to talk about uh, rose care for the summer and what you need to do for it. My name is Scott Klinich, uh, and you're joining us at our garden at Auto and Sons Nursery here in Fillmore, California. Beautiful morning today. It's uh, uh, a couple days right now before summer solstice. Uh, where we've got the longest daylight of the year, and it's uh, a good time to kind of uh, summertime, first day of summer, and uh, get out in your garden, a few things to get ready for the hot days of summer. That's what today's talk is mostly about, is about how to take care of your garden in the summer months. So I'm going to talk a little about summer dormancy to begin with. Uh, all plants, when it gets really hot, they shut down. The, 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 the stomata on the back of the leaves, they shut down to reduce water, transpiration. The, the plant kind of goes into a, a winter, a summer dormancy, much like they do in winter. And they're going to they kind of slow down. Uh, so that's what summer dormancy is. So some of the, a lot of the talk I'm talking about is kind of dealing with that summer dormancy and how you're going to um, um, encourage the blooms along the way, but not too much. So the, uh, the, one of the first things to talk about is watering. Uh, a lot of places uh, in our area, of course, will hit 100 degrees, maybe more. Uh, and when those places are like that, we need to adjust our watering appropriately. We have uh, 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 the, one of the biggest keys for uh, controlling your watering is mulching. Mulching is really important. I like to see two to four inches of mulch on all the planters. I don't like to see the scorched earth, bare dirt, uh, a nice thick layer of mulch. This, uh, this product right over here, this is a decorative bark. This is a nice, uh, you know, small bark. You can put that in your yard and a, a nice thick layer of that. But it mulch can be most any kind of wood product. Um, it can be, uh, um, uh, what I use in my garden is I have a, a friend who's a tree trimmer. He dumps a big load of tree trimmings in my driveway and we wheelbarrow it around the back of the yard and just, uh, just cut up pine trees that he gets from his jobs. So that's an excellent mulch. A lot of the communities have uh, uh, free green waste that's been chopped up and composted. You can bring that to your garden, uh, collect that uh, uh, multiple ways. I think uh, the type of mulch is more dependent on your aesthetics of your garden, what you want to look. Uh, this type of mark, this type of bark would be more for a formal looking garden, more, more uniform. Uh, my garden at my house is more eclectic, I suppose. And so the chips work really well with that kind of a um, the kind of a look, uh, but uh, any kind of a wood product. I like the wood because the wood breaks down. As the wood breaks down, of course, it's feeding your soil. And the, as you feed your soil, uh, you're feeding the microbiology in the soil. And that's feeding the roots in your soil with the nutrients the plant needs. So a nice thick layer of some type of mulch. I don't like the plastic. I don't like uh, um, rubber tires. Uh, the, I don't like uh, gravel, uh, mainly because those don't break down. They just sit there forever. And uh, you want to be feeding your soil. That's the whole idea. A thick layer of soil, a thick layer of mulch will also uh, reduce your weeds. Um, you still get some weeds because they'll blow in with the wind. Some seeds will blow in and they'll grow, but they're really easy to pull out when, the, when, they're, when they're rooted in the mulch. Uh, they can pull out really easy. So uh, a nice thick layer of mulch is what you want to do. Um, you can buy, like by the bag, like we have here, <clears throat> but it's probably the most expensive way to do it that way. It's the most convenient because you can just get a, you know, a 25 pound or 30 pound bag of mulch, carry it to your yard, you're all set. Uh, the best way is to get in bulk, ideally if you get it in, a, 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 like I say, a, um, a, a, people can deliver it, you can go pick it up places. Um, I checked one year and it was um, about 40 to $90 a yard to buy it in bulk, whereas if you do it by the bag, it's well over $120 a bag, I mean a yard. Um, and just a, a note, the um, a three inch thick layer is, is one cubic yard, is one, uh, get this right, a three inch thick is one cubic yard, will cover 100 square feet. So 100 square feet, 10 by 10 area, three inches thick, one yard. So you can kind of figure out how much you need for your garden with that, with that uh, amount. The other question is how much to water. It's really hard for me to say use this water, use that much water. But what I'd like to say is, uh, depending on where you're at, you could be on the coast, you could be inland. You, uh, and so what you need to do is to um, take uh, uh, your plants, your garden, and water it really well. Just water it really well so it's well saturated. And then don't water for a few days. And don't water for a few more days. And wait until you see the plant actually start to wilt. You'll see the plants. You'll see this nice tender growth. It'll just kind of just tip over like that. You know, you'll see it when it starts to wilt. And it might have been a week, it might have been 10 days. And you'll know it, and that way you'll know that in your garden, 
once you water it really well, it takes that amount of time in those weather conditions. So that, say, it's, say it took you 10 days, and so you would be able to know that, okay, I need to water like every eight days. And, you, and, and if it gets warmer, you're gonna shrink that down to maybe only five days. If it gets hotter, I mean, it gets cooler, you can make that even longer for a two week interval. But you, it depends on your garden and your watering system. You may have sprinklers, you may have drip, you may have overhead, you have different kinds of emitters, different kinds of spot sprayers. There's so many choices, sandy soil, heavy soil. But that's the only way I know if you can tell for your garden is to go and just let it start to dry out. Not too far, you don't wanna damage anything, but you're going out there and you're watching it during the, during the day and seeing what the plants are doing. So take a look at that and see, and that way you'll know how, how much water to put on. Yeah. We have a question from Tony. How much water does a 20-year-old rosebush need, and how often should I water them? All right, Tony. The, uh, a 20-year-old ro rosebush should be fairly established, and uh, uh, you're going to want to put about maybe five gallons of water on there, approximately. But again, by, by, letting it, by watering it really well, and then letting it wilt, you'll know, have a better idea of, of how much how, and how often you need to do. You want to be sure to saturate that soil. Uh, you don't want to just take a, you know, a hose and put your finger on it and, and squirt some water over the top and think you're done and the water only gets this far down. You want to be sure to get plenty of water on there so it goes deep. And you want to put enough water on there that it goes deep but not run off. So sometimes you can put a, a, a large amount of water on there but it runs off, it doesn't do you any good. That's why uh, drip irrigation or, or slow emitters work really well or just a trickle on a hose allows that water to go deep. Does that take care of it? We have another question from Robin. What is the best way to protect your roses if you know 100 degree temperatures are predicted? Uh, so you know that 100 degrees temperatures, hopefully you've put a bunch of mulch out and that's giving your plants a chance to get uh, uh, the soil, keeps your soil cooler and keeps your, 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 your moisture where it belongs. And of course you want to irrigate your plants really well uh, ahead of time so that they're well, well saturated. So water your plants really well, thick layer of mulch, will that'll help take care of that. Any others? Gail asks, how do I transition my roses to less often and quantity of water? How much are you watering when you do? An example, how long with what size emitter or color head? Okay, it's hard to talk about emitters. I'm gonna talk about it a little bit, but uh, emitters come in all different kinds, sizes, shapes. We got uh, different colors. Um, these little uh, drippers like this. We got uh, a little green one here. This one puts out two gallons an hour. Little yellow type flag type that kind of drips off there. Got this kind on a hose. This is a little green emitter. This does a half a gallon per hour. Um, this little kind here is a little sprayer. Kind of just a sprays all over the place. Different kinds will do different amounts for different lengths of time. Um, with the drippers, the uh, you want to put it out there so it's, uh, you get about five gallons per hour, five gallons per irrigation. Now some of the drip, drippers might do a one gallon per hour. So you need on for five hours if you can do that situation. Or have two emitters and have it run for two and a half hours or three, or you get the idea. So you gotta get, put about uh, enough water on there so it gets it. Now, if you've got uh, plants that have been uh, well established, um, they're getting their water for, from some place, the roots are deep enough, they might be working their way over towards a grass area and getting sprinkler water or someplace else. And um, the, the plants are, are doing really well getting their water at that point. But if you want to uh, transition them from being, from, if you want to transition them from being watered, say, every day to being watered once a week, you've got to slowly transition by uh, stretching the water out for uh, a period of time. So you're going to say, see, so currently you're on every day for, uh, for five minutes because you're doing sprinklers. Maybe you'll do every other day for 10 minutes and then uh, do that for a few months. And then, uh, then, then you stretch out to every third day or every fourth day to maybe 20 minutes at that point. So you're going to slowly, it's going to take maybe a year before you get that plant, those roots down to be able to find that deeper water. And that's going to help you at that point. All right. So let's move on to, uh, oh, drip irrigation basics. That's my next thing. <coughs> We installed drip irrigation in our garden here. And, oh, I meant to grab one of the hoses. Oh, I'm talking to me. You wanna grab one of those hoses? I can talk about that a little bit. The, um, the we, we took and put valves on, the valve here, and you would, I'm gonna be real basic here. The valve here could be on a faucet or something like that. Then you're gonna hook up some sort of a, a, um, a filter. You need some sort of filtering system because of course the drippers have very fine, fine holes. And you're gonna hook on your hose onto here. Your hose could be, uh, uh, any different types of things here. Um, this is what we use in our garden here. 
this kind of hose, thanks. It goes right onto there. But every 12 inches, there's a tiny little hole here. 12 inches here, 12 inches there. The dripper is actually inside there. And these drippers do one gallon per hour. So every 12 inches, there's a, there's a dripper. So we just ran this all down both sides of the rose garden. Each, each rose plant has uh, one of these hoses on each side of the plant. And uh, that's giving it water. Probably eventually we'll need to, we can remove one of the, one of the lines once the, rose, once the roots get established. But that's what we've done here in the garden. Like I said here, on these different kinds of emitters, uh, these just kind of drip, drip off right at the edge over here. And uh, you're going to want to balance your amount of uh, your time. Sometimes I've had people, I ask them how often they uh, run their drippers. They say for 10 minutes. Well, 10 minutes is nothing on a dripper because you're only doing an hour, an hour per gallon. That's what, maybe a cup of water? I mean, that's just nothing. So you want to, um, uh, you know, on a, a one gallon per hour dripper, you want to run it for at least an hour, if not a couple hours, if you, and you want to have them for a few, a few drippers on each plant. I like to have at least two drippers on each plant because sometimes these drippers will get plugged and that way you're kind of hedging your bet that if one gets plugged, at least you got some sort of irrigation out there that's gonna, gonna still get out there. Um, some of these can be cleaned easily enough, like this little flag type, this comes off. Well, maybe not so easy, oh, there we go, there we go. It comes off and you can clean it. Sometimes you get little bugs in there. Sometimes little, uh, little, what, little uh, um, ants might crawl back on its side. Sometimes you'll put a little tube on here, like these have gone, a little tube. That kind of helps keep the critters out, a little dripper on the end there. So different ways of hooking them up. They all work really well. It just works, well, it's just a matter of what works well for your system in your garden. I do like drip irrigation, but I also like overhead irrigation. The one thing nice about overhead irrigation is it keeps the foliage clean. It keeps the, um, allows the, uh, the, uh, the, the fungal spores are drowned by the extra water. The mites and insect eggs are drowned. So it washes the foliage off. So I do like overhead water, but the drip irrigation is nice to have it. So it's right where you right water, really where you need it. You're not watering the pathways. Let's see, meters, flags, talk about, okay. Okay, any questions on irrigation to me? Uh, I think we covered those already. Covered them all? Yep. Excellent. Okay, let's talk about fertilizing. You've been fertilizing all spring to encourage beautiful flowers. This, by the way, is carding mill. If you didn't, uh, if I don't think I mentioned that yet. Carding mill, wonderful David Austin rose. Um, these were actually hedged um, three or four weeks ago. And uh, they had finished blooming, went through with hedge trimmer, just hedged the whole thing back and forth. And look at them now, beautiful. Got all these nice buds coming up, flowers. Got a few finished flowers. And uh, just making a really nice display right here. Wonderful fragrance right here. Um, I mean, back to fertilizing. The, um, when, you're, when you're fertilizing in, for summer, if you're looking toward for the hot summer months, you don't want to encourage your plants to grow too much. The fertilizer will be pushing the plants to, to grow, put on soft growth, put on more flowers. Uh, summer months, the plant's trying to slow down because of the heat. Uh, we're all inside anyway, so because it's too hot for us to be outside. So uh, it's a good time to kind of cut the fertilizer down about 50% of your normal amounts. Doesn't matter which fertilizer you're using, just whatever you put on at this time of year, I would cut it back 50%. If it says use a cup, use a half a cup. Really simple, watering really well. Uh, water it right through the mulch, of course, when you put the fertilizer down, just to water, uh, the, put the fertilizer down, and then water the fertilizer right through the mulch. And that takes the nutrients right down to the roots. Um, let's see. Uh, kinds of fertilizer, uh, let me talk about that real quick here. We've got uh, the organic type here. 100% uh, organic, uh, it's a 462. Uh, the four is the nitrogen, the middle is phosphorus, last potassium. The, f the first number, number four, um, that's gonna help your green growth. The middle number is uh, for flowers, helps the flowering, last number for the roots. Uh, so we're gonna encourage flowering with this, this one here. Um, and it's an organic, which means it's gonna slowly break down with the soil. As a, the, the nutrients are not in here exactly but the soil microbiology breaks it down so the plant can pick up those nutrients. That's how that one is. Then we have grow power here. Oops. And then we have grow power here. And grow power was a 531, 531. Um, I like this fertilizer because it has an organic base in it. Uh, the humic acid really feeds your soil, helps your soil biology. And it, uh, um, it has a chemical base too, so it's kind of best of both worlds there. Um, then this last one that just tipped over, 
This is uh, our, the 29.9. This is the fertilizer we actually use in the nursery. Uh, this is something new for us. We've got a 25 pound bag now, a little more manageable than the uh, 50 pound bags we've had. But uh, this is a 29.9. That 20 is a slow release fertilizer. It is a chemical based fertilizer. Uh, the 20 percent nitrogen and it will uh, feed your plants for three months. So it's a real nice product for that. That's the, 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 the super, super blend, 29.9. Uh, let's see. So that's, uh, that's fertilizers. Then we're going to move on to... I have a couple questions here. Oh, questions. There we go. Why are the... Paula asks... Paula has a couple questions. Why are the leaves on my roses turning yellow or have yellow spots? Oh. Um, yellow leaves tend to be from a lack of, of nitrogen. So check your fertilizer. You want to you want to fertilize. Uh, if you the, the spots could be from a uh, could be you had some um, black spot, a fungal disease in there. I'll talk gonna talk talk about fungal disease in just a little bit. Uh, yeah, pretty soon here. And but the um, generally speaking, the yellow would be for either overwatering. Overwatering can cause a yellow haze over the entire plant. Um, and then the uh, too much watering, so you can cut back on your watering if that's a concern. Take a look at that. And monitor your watering a little bit more or a lack of nutrients. So uh, I need to add more fertilizer. She also asks, some of the leaves on my rose bushes have a white coloration on the leaves. Oh. Why? Back to fungus. We got, um, that would be called powdery mildew. It's a fungus called powdery mildew. And what it does is it, uh, um, uh, it, it grows on the plant. And usually it's only a problem in spring when you have warm days and cool nights. Once we get into a different cycle of hot days and, and warm nights, it will, uh, you won't have, have black spot or uh, powdery mildew or even rust for that matter uh, any longer. Um, there are ways to control those diseases. Um, there are a couple products for, for that. This, uh, this copper soap is an organic way of controlling fungus. Um, or, 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 organic copper soap, creative name, uh, ready to use product. This will control the fungus. Also, you can use a neem oil neem oil those are two another organic way of controlling it um, the problem with with either of these products is they both have oils in them and you can't use them when it's over 80 degrees uh, the, 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 so you want to use them early morning when it's cool or late in the afternoon or after or evening when it's cooling off so you want to uh, uh, the problem with the oils is that the oils coat the foliage and the foliage gets uh, the foliage is breathing the plant breathes through those leaves and when you coat the foliage with the oil it suffocates, of course, the fungus, but it's also suffocating the leaf also. And the leaf is trying to breathe hard because it's warm outside, it's gonna burn. So that's why you wanna use it when the temperatures are below 80 degrees. Uh, so those are good products for that. If you're in an area that, that does, you can't use the oils, uh, there's a chemical method called Immunox. Immunox controls uh, all three of those, rust, powdery, powdery mildew, and black spot. Um, this is a chemical way of doing it. You would mix that in with a, uh, um, like a Hudson sprayer. These are the ones that we really recommend. They're, um, you would take this and you put this into here 100%. You pour that in there 100%. Read the instructions. Tells you what, how many tablespoons. Turn the dial at the top here to the right amount of tablespoons. Say it's uh, uh, two tablespoons. So line that up with a little button right there. Hook your hose on there. Go out and spray your plants. All done. Take the bottle out. 100% concentrate, pour it back inside the bottle, and then uh, you haven't wasted any product. Rinse everything off with some water. Usually I do that on the lawn area so it doesn't go into the planters or into, I mean, into, the, into the gutter, driveway or something. So that's a really nice uh, application there. Um, so that would work also with the neem oil. You could use this with the neem oil also. This, this particular product comes with a ready to use, so just squirt, squirt, squirt. If you have just a few plants, that's very convenient. Okay, so that's for fungus issues. Okay, what else did you have, Timmy? Um, she would also like to know how to keep your roses stronger, longer. Um, keeping your roses stronger, longer, could be nutrients, but it could just be the variety itself. Some varieties just don't uh, have strong stems, just the way they grow. Uh, if, you've, uh, you could, if you have uh, um, too much fertilizer, that can make the plant grow really fast. Too much shade make the plant grow really fast and those stems would not be as strong. Uh, so that would be a issue with those. And also, let's see, uh, variety. So some varieties just are like that. 
I know David Austin's has a number of varieties that tend to tip their heads. This carding mill doesn't have it, of course, I'm looking at it. But uh, other varieties, they do like to just tip their heads. So you'll see that on some varieties. And it's just a matter of the genetics of that variety. So uh, you need to either uh, use those like in a bowl or in a small vase or something like that, that uh, if you're going to cut those uh, in a garden, they can be up in a pot, up in a pot on a bench or something, up in a, um, a, a raised planter, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so what, what else? John wants to know about fertilizing with growing roses in containers. Oh, container roses. Um, roses do excellent in containers. The, uh, you want to use a good quality potting soil. Um, I had a customer this last week who had some container and she had some problems. They weren't doing really well and discovered that she had been using planting mix and she used that 100% in the pot. Well, the problem with planting mix is it has no drainage. There's no, there's no, um, there's no air porosity within the, within the soil mix. And so the, pot, the planting mix is supposed to be used with dirt, so it creates those pores, that airspace, that drainage. And so she had some problems. So we had to, I talked her through um, pulling that plant out and repotting re it into some, with some potting soil. So, anyway, so you, use, you, want, you want to use the right kind of potting soil in a, in a container. The bigger, the better, really. But you, you, know, you don't want something this big for a miniature rose. But like whiskey barrels are a nice size, that kind of a wine barrel, that kind of size. Those are about uh, 20, 24 inches wide, about uh, 15 inches deep. Uh, the hybrid teas do excellent in those. All the English do well in those. Um, um, even bigger pots if you wanted to. Uh, if you do do pots, try and raise them up off the ground a little bit. Of course, the pot should have some holes in the bottom so water drains out. Raise the pot with a couple of stones or a stick or something, so it, a couple of bricks, so it just lifts it off the ground. So that way there's plenty of moisture can get out when you water it. When you do raise roses in containers, they do require more water because there's more evaporation going on. Uh, so if you've, in the, in the ground, you might water it, say, twice a week. In a pot, you might water it three or four times a week, especially when it's warm. So be aware of that. Um, yeah, roses do great in containers. Any others? Lauren has a question. She recently moved into a new house in Valencia. With, she had just planted some roses with plenty of direct sunlight. And while they're growing really well with nice dark leaves, she says she's hardly gaining any blooms. She's wondering if it's her soil she says she has a fairly heavy clay loam soil, or is it that they're new and still just getting adjusted? Well, it could be the variety, for one thing. It could maybe that variety just doesn't bloom as often. Um, blue, roses tend to un go through a, a, a four to six week cycle of blooms. They kind of, uh, once the flower is finished, by the time the next ones come up, it's going to take a little bit of time to uh, get it to, to re-bloom. And the, um, um, the lack of blooms could also be a lack of nutrients, just uh, again, fertilize. You mentioned dark green foliage, but maybe that's just the variety itself, but maybe some uh, nutrients in there would help give it a little kick. So I, I would recommend uh, um, uh, fertilizing, and uh, yeah, that'd be the biggest thing I would think. We fertilize and be a lot, lack of blooms. Okay, that's it. Okay, great. All right. It was really nice having people write in by these questions. You know, it's kind of helps, uh, helps to talk along. I like doing the live talks when we do them and when the, before coronavirus, we could uh, actually have the questions. It really helps a lot. And it's, it's nice having. Oh, there was a question I had on, uh, someone said they had flowers that didn't open. I want to mention that. It's called balling. Let's see, I don't, especially when you have roses like this that have a lot of petals. I'll pick one here, like this guy here. And sometimes they'll just, just be, this one, of course, I don't, don't have it here, but the, the flower will just stay like that, right? So you do, they just don't open up, and, it just, and the flower just kind of tips over, and it's done. It never opens up. That's called balling, and it's, it's, a, it's caused by a fungus that gets between the petals, uh, and it, um, it's a gray mold called botrytis. And when it gets between the petals, it glues those petals together so they can't fully open up. Usually you only see that when there's uh, overhead irrigation, foggy days, uh, maybe along the coast, we've got a lot of moisture in the air. Uh, once it dries out, that'll be, it'll be, it'll go away. You won't have those problems anymore with those varieties. Um, if it's, you have a lot of it, uh, there are sprays, but I tend not to use, tend to think the sprays are uh, environmentally necessary. Um, it's best to wait for the weather to change. Uh, and try to, if you uh, have a lot of that, uh, go with varieties that have fewer petals. A lot of the petals, when you have a lot of petals, they just glue together like that. That's, that's one of the balling. Uh, okay. Okay, let's talk about pest control. We have a lot of questions on pest control. I'm going to try and cover some of them here. And Timmy will catch us up if I miss something. During the summer months, the biggest problem with uh, pests is mites. Mites are a tiny insect. It's, it's a spider, spider mite, 
and they like to get on the backside leaves and down inside the plant where it's they're kind of protected. And uh, mites like it hot and dry and dusty. And so if you're along a road or a path where there's a lot of dust going up, you'll have a lot of mite problems. They will spin webs. You'll see webbing in, in high infestation areas. And uh, the, one of the easiest way to control mites is with water. Just take your hose, take a, take a nozzle, take a nozzle. <laughs> Uh, this is really handy. Um, get in there and spray like, you know, under, underneath the plant. Get in here like this. Just kind of spray on the bottom. Just kind of wash, washing under the foliage, down inside the plant. Down inside, you know, get in there like that and wash the whole plant away. That way you can wash, you know, you wash them, you're knocking those mites loose. You're wrecking their webbing. Um, and once the, the, that'll help des destroy their, their nests and it will uh, reduce the populations. Uh, what's that? Do it in the morning, right? Do it in the morning, yes. Do it in the morning. Best time to do it in the morning. Um, I don't, it, ideally you wouldn't be watering the plants in the evening so that the plants have moisture overnight. You want to do it in the morning. Uh, but a good wash is really, is ben, really beneficial for the plants. Uh, so water, water, water. Now sometimes it builds up and you have problems. You need to do a, do a more of a uh, proactive or a chemical control. The neem oil I mentioned before, that will control mites really well. There's another product, uh, the, um, so many things here. This uh, organic insect control will control them. If you're going to go to a chemical control, the uh, chemical control of seven, this sprayer seven is, uh, is re works really well for mites. Uh, one caution on, on the seven is a, it is a, um, a, 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 a real uh, chemical. Um, there is some seven that they market now that just says the word seven, but it's not the carbaryl that this seven is. Uh, so this is the one that will control mites really well. You can also use the, um, the bare product here, the advanced, bio-advanced product. Um, this works well, you use this on the soil and it uh, controls through the plant itself. But uh, the oil works really well, the water works really well, then kind of going up to more hazardous stuff, you would use the, 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 um, the neem oil, the organic, a seven, and that would be the last one I would use. So that's for controlling those, um, the mites. Um, so uh, that's for that. Also, let's see, um, that's pretty much it for thrip mites. I mean, the other insect you'll see is thrips. Oh, I'm being waved down, there's a question. Rick and Penny want to know, what do you think is the best organic pest control for spider mites? The best organic pest control is the water. I would just wash the plants down. Just wash the plants, just water. Uh, that's why I mentioned earlier, drip irrigation is good for the roots, overhead irrigation is good for insect and disease control. So um, that would do the water. That's the best organic way. Um, and it can be challenging because you have to do it multiple times during the week. It's just not a one shot deal because you're only affecting those, those critters that are there right then, right then. Any more on insects? Got them. Okay. Thrips. Let's talk about thrips now. Uh, there's two kinds of thrips that we have in, in Southern California here. Uh, one is the Western flower thrip, which we had for a long time. Um, didn't cause too many problems. Uh, to, to, I'm sure I can find some in here. Western flower thrip. To, to look for them, I won't bother to have them zoom on on this, but uh, you can just take a flower, one that's fairly fresh, and start to open it up. And you'll see the Western flower thrips crawling around. They, they like to hide down inside the petals. That one's kind of falling apart already. Let me take a fresh one. They like to hide down inside the petals, right where the petal connects, and you'll see them. They're little tiny things. They run around really fast. I mean, they're probably the size of a, they could probably put, two could dance on the head of a pin. But usually like on the lighter color flowers where you see them easiest. And usually if there's only like a couple, I wouldn't bother to spray. But if there's a dozen or more, then I would spray. Because the damage that thrips do is they will, um, they have the mouth parts scrape and they will cause a scarring of the flower petals and just makes an unattractive uh, flower and flower bud. So that's uh, something to uh, look at. And that would be the Western flower thrip. And to control that one, we use right here, Monterey Garden Insect Spray. Monterey Garden Insect Spray has a chemical in it called um, Spinosad, which is a biological. And it um, is that one called uh, um, Captain Jack's. You'll see that one around too. So they both have the same product in it. We sell the Monterey Garden Insect Spray and other places have Captain Jack's. Uh, they both work really well and they will control the thrips for you. The other thrip that's, that showed up about three or four years ago is one called uh, Chili Thrip, C-H-I-L-L-I. -L -L -I. 
it's not named for the plant and it's not named for the city, for the country. It's actually named after the guy who discovered it. And um, but uh, the chili thrip is um, uh, uh, it do doesn't go after flowers. It go actually goes after the stems. And it will get on this, these nice soft stems, and it scrapes these stems like this on both with a nice tender growth. That's where it'll it'll scrape, and it makes the, the as, as it scrapes the course, the plant exudes juice, and it turns black, and it makes kind of a black scarring. It it uh, distorts the foliage, it distorts the stems, it makes the plant very unattractive. Um, that's the chili thrip, and the way to control that one, this is, this is a little harder to control, um, but initially I would go through and use the western or the uh, garden. Monterey Garden Insect Spray on that one too. And you want to do it probably every week for at least, at least three weeks in a row. Um, you could mix it up. If you're in an area that you can spray the neem oil, you could do the Monterey Garden Insect Spray one week and then come back through and do the neem oil and then come back through and do the Monterey Garden Insect Spray the third week. Now we kind of mix things up. So that should reduce the populations tremendously. If you're still having an issue, I would continue with that same cycle, but also include the insect and disease and mite control. Nope, not this one. This one over here. Rose and flower. This has a, a systemic insecticide. That it's, a, it's a fertilizer. You put on the roots, it goes into the plant, and it controls the insects that suck on the juices of the plant. So this will work also. But uh, that's like a last resort. I like to see, again, go with the Monterey Garden Insect Spray, nice organic. Uh, go with the neem oil. If you still have problems, then, then ramp it up, continue to do that, but then do this, uh, this one here. Now this does have a fertilizer on, in it, so if you have been doing a fertilizer you, uh, with a different product, you would cut back on the fertilizer and you would uh, uh, use this one instead. Because you don't, don't want to double dip on the fertilizer. So you've got your fertilizer, you've been adding your grow power, but then you add this one here to be double, could, could get some toxicity issues. So one or the other, not both, but we're looking at thrips right now, and that's what you want to do to control those. Any questions on thrips? Yeah, Timmy. Margaret has a question. She says, it looks like something is eating, potentially stripping the, the leaves of the plant. She's looked for signs of different critters, especially worms, but she doesn't see anything. What could it be? Should she spray with neem oil? They're in pots, not in the ground, so she knows it's not squirrels or mice. Thank you. OK. Um, <clears throat> I, I, heart, until you find a critter, I hate to have you spray something just, just randomly. Um, that'd be my, my first concern. I would be sure to go out there at night and look for uh, the critter because sometimes you'll see things at night that you won't see during the day. When you say it's stripping the foliage, I've known uh, lizards to come and do that. They'll actually run over, run over, run up, up into a pot, uh, strip foliage off and take it and consume it or take it back to a nest. So you could have something as simple as lizards and there's no way to control lizards. Um, not unless you have little kids that like to pull the tails off, I suppose. But uh, that's, a, that's a, a grandson thing I've seen. But anyways, so, so uh, um, yeah, um, I don't know what would be stripping the foliage off. My first thought would be mice, which is common mites, rats, um, squirrels, uh, rabbits will do that too. They'll strip things. Um, but you said you don't have those because they're up in a pot. So I would go with lizards. Um, but I would go out there with, at night with a flashlight to take a look. If uh, you're inland, I would mostly go with lizards. If you're on the coast, it could be the... Um, um, uh, rose slug. Rose slug is a little uh, critter that doesn't strip the leaves off. It actually makes uh, makes holes in the foliage. It will uh, kind of the, the the rose slugs come up at night, and they will uh, um, they'll eat the space between the veins. Kind of makes an hourglass look on the on the leaf itself. Uh, so it, uh, that's another concern. You, I don't see that, that ever inland. It's always on the coastal issue, um, and for that the rose slug. Good control for that is the uh, again the Monterey Garden insect spray that organic one I talked about earlier with the spinosad real good product for that. Okay, so that's uh, so that's my my guess on your missing foliage. Anything else? Good. All right. So let's talk about summer pruning. So we've gotten out of our uh, spring and things are flowering profusely. And now the warm weather is coming on. We want to kind of give the plant as it goes into its summer dormancy a summer pruning and for the summer pruning we're going to do a little bit of work in in, in trimming the plant down we're going to take off about maybe 30 percent of the plant we're going to remove any branches that might be crossing we're going to move anything that's dead so i've got a sample over here we're going to go go do a little work on so uh, let's walk with me
beautiful day in the garden. Okay, right on over here. Let's see. Where's a good one? This one right here, I think. This one is uh, Princess Charlene de Monaco. Nice, uh, it's kind of finished its flowering here. It's got a few finished flowers. One, one that's, uh, oh, a little bud there. We'll probably leave that one probably. But we're gonna take this and do a little pruning to him. And so we're gonna, when we do our pruning, um, normally, I suppose in your own garden, if you're on top of things, you'd be deadheading this stuff. It got a little, little tall. Uh, let me mention about deadheading. What deadheading is what you do is we take it when the flowers are finished, rather than have the energy go into making seed, we don't want seed, we want more flowers. So we're gonna trim these back. And you wanna trim back, you wanna come back at least five leaves. This whole thing is a leaf, one leaf, right? So you're gonna count down five. One, two, three, four, five. And you wanna cut so that branch, that leaf is right above. Okay, so this was on here. And so there's a leaf right there and that leaf is gonna hit over that direction. So that's gonna discard that. So the new, the new growth is gonna come from the top of this leaf. Let me show you over here too. So we're gonna come in here, we got uh, one, two, three, four, five. Now this one in particular, this five kind of points to the inside of the plant. I'm gonna go a little bit lower and have it go to one that's just on the other side of the plant. The reason being the new growth, this new flower stem will grow from here, okay? And it's gonna create a new stem for, for flowers at that point. And that will, um, you're kind of directing which way the growth is gonna go. By directing the, the growth, you're going to you want to do it so the growth is in a vase shape. So you kind of want the plant to be like this. So you've got uh, all the branches on the outside and the middle being open. Okay, so the vase shape. But that's really kind of tall. You know, if you went down five leaves and this grew two feet and you go five leaves and that grows two feet and goes five leaves, uh, you're going to have a tall plant. So normally you'd come through, even when it was tall like that, you come down in here and take it a little shorter. Okay. But now we're going to do our summer pruning. That's just on deadheading. That's a general maintenance question. I think we had one of those two. So again, I'm going to cut a plant down about a third. I'm also going to uh, uh, look for the see opening up a little bit. So this guy in here, I'm going to come in here. So that one, come in here about there. Come on here. This whole branch, well, I think I'll leave it there. Okay, I'm gonna come in like that. Come in here, trim this, right up there. Again, I this a branch will come this way, this branch will come over this way. See, so I'm kind of looking for directing it the right direction. Those are some buds there, I'm gonna leave those because look nice. Okay, I'm gonna look down inside the plant here, gonna see if there's any crossing branches that we can need to kind of clean out a little bit. There are a number of in there in here oh let's see you're gonna cut that one there kind of hard to see i understand but just a little thinning is all i'm trying to do a little thinning we're gonna come through like that trim that guy nothing as severe as when we're doing our winter pruning of course that's a whole nother class we do in our january classes which i'm hoping by january you can have our live classes that'll be nice okay so a little pruning a little bit of Little dead branch right there, gonna trim that off. Okay, got that thinned out there. Come over here, a little bit of thinning. So that's, that has that flower on it, leave that one. Okay, this guy here, gonna come in here. Okay, I'm gonna trim those down right to there. Okay, got this one here. Okay, well, thanks for joining us again. We had a little problem with the microphone here, but this is what I was talking about as far as um, doing a summer pruning, just kind of reducing it down about a third or so, not too much, leaving enough leaves in here for the canopy, um, going down inside the plant and removing any crossing branches, any spindly branches, just to kind of give it a chance to, to grow with these larger canes that have grown this spring to take off. So that's, that's basically your summer pruning. Um, the plant, uh, I left a flower here. You're still gonna get a few buds and a few flowers coming. This will be ready for a spectacular spring, fall bloom uh, in just a, a few months here. So, um, any questions on uh, left on there, Timmy?
Martha has a question. She said that they cut the dead roses down after they bloomed and were dead, and now the tip of the branch has turned brown. Will a new rose be produced? Uh, um, oftentimes you'll get a little dead, uh, dead right in here. This this uh, um, will die back a little bit here. But the new bud is going to come from this point right here and where this leaf is at, this node. And that's where the new branch is going to come to create more flowers. If for some reason that also died, then the next one down is where the next branch will come. So certainly you'll get more flowers coming off of that branch. Um, Bernadette has a question. She says, love promise the flowers turn black and dry shortly after they open. What's well, going on there? We probably, ha probably I'm, I'm guessing you're more inland. We had some problems here and that with that heat we had uh, just, uh, was it two weeks ago or a week ago? A week ago, last week. It was 100 degrees here and it was too hot for the flowers and too hot for the plant. Uh, the flowers oftentimes just, just sunburn and they just didn't, didn't grow. So it's just, uh, they just, uh, they just dried up and wilted almost just like paper mache really quick. So that's, my guess is that's what happened is that it dried up just due to the heat. Mm. Bernadette also had a brother Caphael rose bush that uh, had lots of flowers, but they remained closed and didn't open. What's going on? Well, my guess with that one is the, the opposite, which would be the, uh, the botrytis we talked about earlier that would have uh, uh, the glue those petals together and that would allow the petals to open up. So that, my guess would be for that would be a botrytis issue or the balling we talked about actually. Um, any other things? Valerie had a question on what's the best way to avoid getting rust? Avoid getting rust? The, uh, the, I suppose the best way to avoid getting rust uh, select varieties that are disease resistant. Certain varieties are prone to diseases, rust being one of them. Uh, so that'd be your first thing is to select varieties that uh, are disease resistant. Uh, the next thing is would be to do a proactive spray control program using the neem oil or using the Immunox uh, fungicides. Uh, with those, of course, you won't be able to control the, um, uh, they're, all, they're all proactive. You can't control the disease that's already on there. So you're, o you're only c preventing infection from any new infections that come from and infect the leaves. So that's uh, uh, what you'll be doing there. Valerie also asked, is there a recommended action you can take to reduce the spread of rust? To reduce the spread of rust? Um, not really, because the rust spores are gonna, gonna move throughout the, 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 the air movement within the can canopy of the garden. Uh, they're gonna get on your, on your clothes, you're gonna transfer them around. The biggest thing with any of the diseases, they're all climate dependent. When the climate is correct, the right day temperature, the right night temperature, the right humidity, uh, when those things click, 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 you'll get, you'll get a disease. It could be powdery mildew, it could be rust, it could be black spot, it could be um, any of the diseases that will, will uh, just, just happen when those environmental conditions are correct. Once we get into a more dry condition, then we won't have those fungal diseases and we have to deal with other, other challenges like mites. <laughs> so, any other questions? That's it, okay. Well, thanks for watching. I uh, hope you learned something along the way. Any questions, just uh, send them off to us. We'll respond as best we can. And uh, have a great day and enjoy your garden. Thanks.